Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I'm your host, Mark Aberti, the content marketing expert, bringing you five new episodes every week where I and top level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success listeners. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. One of the things we have to do to grow our businesses is attract prospects, have a a lot of relationships, being able to build those relationships and getting some of those prospects to become clients. But there's a lot of challenges on that journey to finding prospects, to uh, being able to engage with them, build that relationship, and then getting them to be the client. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that in today's episode. And the person who um, we're going to be talking to really soon, he is the best-selling author of nine books and among the world's most respected thought leaders on sales leadership, and customer experience. He transforms organizations by optimizing talent, leveraging training to cultivate a high-performance sales culture, developing leadership and coaching skills, and applying more effective organizational design. He is an in-demand speaker and spends more than 250 days each year crisscrossing the globe, delivering keynote speeches, workshops, and training programs to high-performing sales teams and leaders. Today's guest for episode 245 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Jeb Blunt. Jeb, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Jeb, I'm really happy to have you on the show. I mean, that whole process that I talked about earlier about finding prospects, building that relationship, uh, getting prospects to become clients, like that's like such an important part for a lot of businesses. And uh, we're going to dive into that, obviously. But one of the things I want to uh, ask you is a little bit of backstory. So I know you wrote the book, Fanatical Prospecting, one of the... Uh, uh, nine best-selling books that uh, you've written. So I wonder if you could go a little deeper to why you wrote uh, Fanatical Prospecting, some of the uh, behind the scenes with that. Yeah, it was it was a book that I'd had in me for a long time and because I'm a, I'm a big fan of prospecting. I believe in it. I know how it builds businesses and even building my own business that, you know, when I started this company 11 years ago, it was just me and a telephone if it hadn't been for my ability to prospect, the business today wouldn't be a thriving organization with um, with a worldwide presence. And, you know, we've got 16 people in our company now, but back then it was just me and a telephone. And but I didn't write it then. I, I, I just I'd, I'd had the, the idea, the concept inside uh, just kind of percolating. But when we if you if you flip forward to 2013, 14, 15, 16 and a little bit even today, there was this major conversation going on where I, I have no other way of calling them other than charlatans, these pseudo experts, people who couldn't sell their way out of a plastic bag. were starting to toot the horn that salespeople didn't need a prospect anymore. In fact, they kept saying that prospecting doesn't work and that if you uh, do outbound prospecting, you're a fool. And what you should do is post blogs and do content marketing and wait for people to come to you. And I knew in my heart and soul that that was just utter BS because I have a team every day that wakes up and does prospecting calls. And, you know, we've gone from, you know, $1 to on track to hit $25 million because we have a robust outbound prospecting effort. I I don't discount content marketing. And I certainly don't discount inbound marketing because it is marketing and is what you should do. Everything in your business should be geared towards getting leads in the door, but there's no company and no salesperson that can generate enough leads to make their number um, purely by inbound marketing or hanging out on social media all day long. That doesn't mean that you won't get leads. It certainly doesn't mean you won't sell something. It just means that you're going to sub-optimize your income and your company's revenue. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why the number one role that hires my company into, into other companies is the CMO, the marketing 
office, top marketing, chief marketing officer brings us in because they know the truth as well. There's no way that inbound marketing can, can, can replace outbound. So I was a little bit pissed off. And in fact, the tone in the book, you can tell that I was a little upset with this, with this really, really bad advice that, that people were giving salespeople. And the reason why the book is, you know, an international bestseller, uh, it's arguably the number one selling book in sales today is because the, uh, the, the, the world got, gets it. The people out there get it. Companies get it. They know that they've got to be able to combine good inbound with good outbound. And when you do that, you, 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 can, you can crush your number. So that's why I wrote the book. It was just this moment of emotional upheaval where I just had enough. And that's, that's how I, I ended up, you know, uh, right. I called my publisher and said, I'm writing this book and that's what we did. And it's interesting how you mentioned that it's good to have inbound and outbound working together. And one of the things I want to ask you is, I mean, you say you have a whole team of people who are helping you making all these different calls. And I'm wondering, how do you go about like getting those numbers, finding uh, the prospects? Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the, the it's a pretty simple thing. Over 11 years, you build a pretty decent database. Either people that you meet at trade shows, people that we meet on airplanes, uh, people who call us, people who come through our inbound forms. If you if you follow me, uh, we have a robust content marketing arm. We have a, a huge platform on social media. SalesGravy.com, my website, has got you know massive amount of content in all of those places. People come to us. We spend a ton of money on advertising, you know, and, and that's I'm I'm not arguing it's one thing better than the other. I I, I don't play you know zero sum games uh, it, with sales or marketing because everything works in its own way. It's all about probability. So we do all of that. Plus, there's this really amazing thing called Google, and you can Google people and find folks. And we use a lot of Google Alerts, for example. We uh, we we sell sales training and, um, and, you know, sales acceleration solutions. So we have a Google alert, for example, when a new vice president gets hired to a company, we have a Google alert set up for that. And when that comes in, we, every day we get it three times a day, we pick up the phone and we call them. We just call the company and ask for the person. We also use a, a tool called zoom info that I absolutely love. It's fantastic. It's right in our CRM. We use Salesforce as our CRM. So if we get a Google alert in and we can't immediately find the person, we we will put their information, we'll just type the information in on uh, Salesforce and Zoom Info finds the information and pulls it up for us. And of course there's there's social media. We we use LinkedIn extensively. It's a, it's a fantastic tool. I argue that LinkedIn is the you know the best tool for sales that was created since the telephone. If you look at, you know, a couple of, you know, big, big changes for salespeople, the car, the phone, the internet, and LinkedIn, really big, really big opportunities for salespeople to connect with people in a different way. And, you know, we followed that through with Instagram and Facebook and, uh, and uh, YouTube and Twitter and our podcast. And you, you know, you have a podcast, you know how powerful a podcast can be with, you know, for connecting with people. And I write books, so I've got you know I've got nine books out there. Most salespeople can't write nine books, and that makes the phone ring as well. So it's a in fanatical prospecting. We talk about balanced prospecting. It's it's balanced for us across prospecting, uh, both cold calling, pure cold calling, you know, getting people in who who have raised their hand, inbound leads that we call, uh, and you know, and pure marketing, pure advertising. And, and and all of the above approach with all of those leads. So even with prospecting, we're telephone, text messaging, email, we do in-person work, we do, we ask for referrals, uh, we use social media. So there's not a, you know, there's not a single, you know, source of leads. It's, it's an always on focus on generating as many leads as we possibly can. And, and then and then qualifying those leads and making sure the very best leads end up in our long-term list in our database, because you know th that become those become our prospects for a year from now, two years, three years from now. And you mentioned LinkedIn as being like right there with radio and telephone and all the big things that salespeople have been able to use to reach out to more people and get more prospects. Can you go a little deeper into how you use LinkedIn and what your strategy there looks like? 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't have, I wouldn't say that I have some, you know, overarching LinkedIn strategy. I, you know, in the book, I talk about, you know, why salespeople need to use social media. And it's, it's a combination of making sure that your LinkedIn page is a great representation of you. So there's tons of resources. You can go to YouTube, type it in. I've got a course at Sales Grade that you can take on it. But you'll find a bunch of good opinions on how to structure your LinkedIn page. So it's, you know, first you focus on your personal branding, uh, then it's connecting with the right people. So in my world, because of what I do and because I have an international audience, uh, I just connect with everybody. So if you, if you come to me and ask for a connection, I'm going to connect with you because everybody is a consumer of my products, my services. And, you know, we get hired to do keynotes and training all the time because an individual salesperson on LinkedIn found us and this happened to us this week found me on LinkedIn, said, I wish you could come key keynote our meeting, and then made an introduction, a, a warm introduction to the person planning the meeting who immediately said, let's talk. And that happened on, on LinkedIn, and that was because I posted a video, and this person commented on the video, and then I sent them a direct message and said, it'd be really great if we could talk to you guys. Let me hook you up with my salesperson who handles that part of our business, and that's how that worked. So part of it is you've got to be sharing content. Uh, content, you know, creates, uh, you know, to increase presence, people see you. And there's two ways to share content. You can create your own content. I'm a content creator, so I make a lot of content. Um, and Or you can curate content. You can grab content from different places. I'm also a content curator. So I use SalesGrade as our platform. But if you're a salesperson, you can pull content from your website, your own company website. If you're if you're a marketer listening to this, you can provide content for your folks that can be insightful content. You can pull it from different people. You can go to Sales Gravy. A lot of people come to Sales Gravy and share content there. But every time you share content, you get a little bit of juice from sharing that content, whether you create it or, or someone else creates it. And I'm not expecting most salespeople are going to be out there blogging and shooting videos all the time. It's a rare group of people that are able to sustain that type of content creation. Uh, then you've got to make you know core connections, and then you've got to be really consistent. I mean, the thing about social media more than anything is just consistently being there because it's about presence and familiarity. The more people become familiar with you, the more likely it is that you're going to move into the familiarity bubble, and the more you move into the familiarity bubble, familiarity bubble, the higher the probability that they're going to engage with you um, either because you call them or because the time is right and their buying window opens. So I, I don't have some deep-seated you know, written down on the board uh, type of social media strategy uh, other than I'm super consistent. I, you know, I work my connections. I try to pay attention to, as, to everything I possibly can. And it's, you know, hard for some folks to imagine what it's like, you know, on, on my end sometimes and I feel bad sometimes, but I get, you know, I get several hundred messages a day. I get several hundred connection requests a day. I'm about to hit my total limit on LinkedIn and there's a lot of dialogue going on all the time. It's a, you know, it is a, a stream of consciousness that, that really takes a lot of work, especially in my world. But for most people, it takes a lot of work. And I even see it with my own salespeople who just get worn out with the pace of social media and managing it every single day. Uh, but if you follow the five C's that are in fanatical prospecting, that'll give you a pretty good platform to work off of. But it's, it's and, I, and, I, and I wanna say this again, there are morons in the world who are telling you that social media is the only way to go. They are morons. Do not listen to these people. Social media is part of a balanced prospecting strategy. It is a core part of it. I'll be the first one to tell you that LinkedIn, like you said, it is, it is up there with the telephone, with the car, with the internet. It is a big, big deal. And you need to be there. But if that is the only place that you are, you are going to fail and you're going to fail hard. And you're, you're, you're not going to make the kind of income that you can make. You're not going to feed your family the way you should. You're not going to advance your career the way you should because it's a massive time suck as well. So I limit my time on LinkedIn pretty much every day to about an hour. And most of that hour is spent at the beginning of the day and a little bit at the end of the day. And, and if I have time in between, if I'm in airports, and you know, I'll play around during the day and comment, what have you. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a massive investment of time. You want to work it in and make it part of your time blocks during your day so it's just part of your daily rhythm.
And uh, in the example you mentioned for LinkedIn, you mentioned how like someone came across your content and that led to this opportunity for you. And uh, that's something where like you keep creating content, good things like that happen. Uh, but like, I mean, Jeb, you made a really good point. Like, I feel like a lot of people think that social media is the only answer. And there's just a lot of uh, other ways to do prospecting. But one of the things I want to ask you is going back to that LinkedIn example, you were uh, like, someone reached out to you, they knew the decision maker and that helped you big time, the person who was uh, organizing the meeting. So like one of the big challenges people face, especially when you're contacting bigger organizations is reaching that decision maker. So how exactly can we reach the decision maker and deal with the gatekeeper if that's the person who we get first? Well, and it, it, it begins with understanding what the gatekeeper's job is. And, you know, number one job is that it's their, their, their job is to protect the time of the people inside that organization. So you can't get mad at them, at them for doing that. They have a job just like you do. So I begin there. I understand what their role is and, and that they're, they're going to keep me out because they don't see any value in that person spending time with me. So when I'm coaching salespeople with gatekeepers, I coach them to understand that you use gatekeepers for information. When I get a gatekeeper, I'm asking for information. I'm, I'm gathering up what's happening with them, what's going on in the organization. I'm, I'm learning when's the best time to call the gatekeeper, or I mean, excuse me, the decision maker. And it sometimes takes time. It takes, uh, you know, it takes several calls. I was uh, with a, uh, a head of sales recently, and we were running an experiment. And this guy, he, this guy was, uh, you know, a really great leader because his salespeople were complaining about gatekeepers. So we were doing a fanatical prospecting boot camp, brought it, brought the other people in, and we did six 30-minute phone blocks during the two-day period. So we everybody had a list, and we would say, okay, so let's stop 30 minutes, 30 dials, set two appointments. And they would call off these lists. And this VP of sales brought in a list of 25 prospects. That was all the prospects he had. And he worked the same list of 25 prospects and these were cold prospects, stone cold. And the first three phone blocks, he didn't get anything but gatekeepers. That was all he got, and he didn't set any appointments, and it was looking kind of bleak. And you know, he even admitted, he said, I haven't made a cold call in like you know 15 years. But by the end of the boot camp, after six phone blocks, he'd set 11 appointments with decision makers off of those 25 numbers. He had a name of a company and a number. Why? Well, because over that period of time, he gathered information from the gatekeepers. He made some friends. He learned the names of the decision makers. So instead of calling in and asking for who's the person to talk to, he called and asked for John. He, um, he, he, he leveraged the information that he had and the persistence to get through. And that's what a lot of salespeople don't get. Like if you call up and you have a name of a company that you want to sell to and a phone number, you're going to get a gatekeeper. And when you ask the gatekeeper who's the person to talk to, the gatekeeper is going to keep you out because that's what they know. So you can use tools like LinkedIn. I certainly recommend doing some research there. You can use the internet. Google's a great thing or Bing or Yahoo or whatever else is out there that you can search on. Um, you can uh, use tools like Zoom Info. Uh, you, you can do those things. But sooner or later, you're going to call in, hit the gatekeeper. You've got to work at it. It takes persistence. And whenever I'm working a list, my goal with that list is to fill in the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. It's to gather enough information so I begin getting these disparate pieces of information and, and putting them all together. And certainly there are situations like the one that I described on LinkedIn where a person commented on a video that I posted, I would be nice if you could come talk to our organization. And I was aware that intentional about making the connection, then getting that person connected to my salesperson so that I got out of the loop. All of that was a, was, was a good thing. That was an inbound person coming to me or making a comment to me that, you know, that really paid off. And that happens all the time. We'll have someone say, hey, you know, do you guys do training in, you know, in Indonesia? Um, and I just happened to have my hands on my, my sales EQ book that was just translated into Indonesia today. So I'm thinking about that. And they'll say, you know, do you have, a, you know, your book in Indonesia, can you come to Indonesia? And I'll also put a salesperson on that and we'll end up with, you know, a three, four, five hundred thousand dollar contract to work with a company in, you know, that area of the world because we were paying attention and we did prospecting and we reached out to them and we, you know, we, we, we did our role and, you know, our job as salespeople. So 
uh, at, at other times, there are companies we want to, we want to attack and that we want to penetrate because they're on our list, and we don't know anything. So we have to start from scratch. And clearly, starting from scratch is harder than having somebody come to you. But that's why you balance things because it's great when people come to us. It's the best thing in the world. But we're always sub-optimized when we're waiting for someone to come to us. But when we go out and we do outbound and we focus on inbound, our numbers go up exponentially. And it's, so that's the, you know, that's the key. And then recognizing that when you're on outbound, you're going to hit gatekeepers. That's just a fact. So just get over it and, and do the thing that you do well as a sales professional and go make a friend and go ask for help. And no, you're not going to get every gatekeeper to let you through. But if you do your job, you're going to get through enough times that you'll have all the business that you can take. And I'm um, like hearing you um, share your insights. I mean, I'm starting to get a little idea of like what the uh, fanatical prospector uh, mindset looks like. And I'm hearing a lot about persistence. I'm hearing a lot about inbounds, but also a focus on outbound as well. And I'm wondering what else do you believe makes up that mindset of a fanatical prospector? Well, I think it's a it's a mindset of of freedom. It's a mindset of independence. It's a mindset of taking your fate into your own hands. The, the fanatical prospector knows with faith that if they if they prospect a little bit every day, if they if they constantly focus on the pipe, that amazing things are going to happen. The fanatical prospecting mindset knows that when you do these things and you do them consistently. You don't have to sit around and whine about this doesn't work or this needs bad or you know nobody's answering the phone today or everybody's rude, being rude to me. You don't do that. You you know through through you know through experience, through faith, through um, through your persistence that that persistence always wins. That by you know by carrying around a pocket full of business cards with you and talking to people everywhere you go and picking up the phone and calling and blocking your time, you know that is going to make you a lot of money. It is pretty simple for me because if you go to any organization anywhere and you look at their top salespeople, look at them, look at what they do. They are fanatical prospectors. They don't all prospect exactly the same way. They, 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 some of them have, you know, tenure in their territories. Some of them are, you know, people who have, you know, who have, uh, are brand new. There are people who do pure cold calls. There are people who have a lot more balance and referrals. It doesn't matter. But the one thing that you can say that is consistent about them is that they are relentless about filling up the pipeline. And it is not something that's put aside till tomorrow. It is their default primary activity and focus of every day is getting new opportunities into the pipe because they know that the pipe is life. And they understand something very basic about selling. And that is the number one reason why salespeople fail is that they have an empty pipeline. And the number one reason why they have an empty pipeline, is they are not consistently prospecting day in and day out using every tool at their, at their disposal. And you mentioned using every tool. And again, we go back to that inbound and outbound. But you also mentioned that you're a content creator and you are engaging with uh, people on LinkedIn for an hour a day. And I'm wondering, how do you balance all that? How do you balance the interacting with people on LinkedIn, the inbound, uh, with the outbound making calls and with the uh, content creation as well? Well, inbound should primarily be handled by your marketing team. So if you're a salesperson, you're on a team, most of your inbound marketing and lead gen should be handled by marketing. Now, if you're an independent, say, insurance agent or in real estate, um, if you are a really small business and you're just starting out and you're the, you know, you're, you were like me when I was sitting at my desk all by myself, you know, banging the phone, then you're going to have to be the inbound marketing person and you're probably going to suck at it pretty badly. So you're not going to have a lot of balance. You're going to work your tail off. When I first started my business and, and, you know, and I didn't have an inbound marketing team, I was working 18 to 20 hours a day getting very, very little sleep. And I did that for three or four years. The other day, I have a marketing team. I have I have sales team. I have support. I have people who are doing all this work for me. So as a as a salesperson, you shouldn't spend a lot of your time worrying about inbound. What you really should be focusing on is how do you manage your day. And what's transformational for salespeople is time blocking. So the way that I balance it is I have my, I have time blocked every day for this. So for example. I do social media before the golden hours. The, the golden hours are the time during the day when I can have a conversation with someone who can buy for me. So I typically am not spending a lot of time on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or any social media uh, during the daytime. 
I do that early in the morning. So 6 a.m. to 7 o'clock or so is my social media time. Then I go into, into making calls. And by the way, it's just not, it's not just social media. It's you know direct messaging on social media in a lot of cases has taken the place of email. So you have to be careful with that. I, you know, I regularly block people who spam me or send me crap messages on social media. You, you invade my social media inbox. Uh, you're, you're not going to last very long. I don't always have that ability to, to completely block you on email, but I can take you out of my life on social media, but you do have that as an opportunity to, to, you know, to, to connect with people, um, text messaging, asking for referrals, if you're, you know, I work with a lot of companies who do, you know, more trade shows and as the economy is getting better, we're seeing a lot more face-to-face -face work. If you're an outside salesperson or you, you're, you know, an independent person walking around and talking to people, networking your community, all of those things have to be balanced out. So when, you know, when we talk about content creation, you know, I, I look, I'm, I'm a realist. I, I, I saw a sales expert the other day go, you know, pounding that salespeople need to be blogging. And I just can't think of a bigger, greater pile of bullshit I've ever heard in my life. Most salespeople are not conditioned to blog and write. They are not going to be able to do that. Most people don't have the ability to, to create interesting content on a video or do what you've done and build out a podcast that has 200 episodes. And you can imagine if the 16 million salespeople you know, that are you know, in North America all decided to start posting their own content there wouldn't, it, no content would stand out. It would, it would be, you know, it would just be an awful experience. And most salespeople can't balance that into their life. I, you know, to be a, writing a blog article for me to write something meaningful is a two or three hour investment. Writing books is a two year investment. Doing simple videos, it's, I do a ton of videos that are 30 to 40 seconds. Usually I have to have a second person with me. I can't stand a video that we're, you know, you're holding the camera out in front of you and staring into it. I find those videos to be just really, you know, just they're very poorly produced. Um, but even taking a quick video on, on, you know, on your iPhone and then editing that video out and making sure that it's in good shape to post it so people want to look at it so you can get, you know, 20, 30,000 views on that video, that takes a lot of time. It takes about an hour of, of work to get a good video up, even if that video is only 40 to 50 seconds long. That's how much time it takes to do it right. Most people can't do that, and it's and it's it's unfair to put you know to, to to bang the drum or bang the gong and say that all salespeople should be writing their own blogs. A better way of looking at content is curation. So, in other words, if you're a salesperson, that's much easier to balance. And there's all kinds of cool ways to do that. I use a couple of apps on my telephone um, that go out and grab content for me. So every day I wake up and there's three or four articles that I can post from other people. I create a lot of my own content. I am a content creator, but that's what I get paid to do. Most people aren't getting paid to do that. So it's much more reasonable to say to salespeople, you should be aware of what kind of content is being produced by content producers in your in in industry, in your space, that's going to be interesting to people that isn't a stupid cat video or cat meme. That's something that, that, that sets you up as an expert and then grab that information and repost it. That's what a Google alert for. Feedly works that way. Um, you know, I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal and I, I read the Wall Street Journal every single day. So there's content everywhere. It's more impactful for you if you're not a content creator to share good content than it is to go try to make content. And I, you know, I, I know I sound like I'm on my soapbox, but I'm just, I'm so over, you know, these, these, you know, these so-called experts telling, you know, the, the, the everyday, um, you know, salesperson who was out there working their tail off trying to make a living for their family, then they ought to be blogging. Some of them should be blogging because some of them have that capacity. Most of them shouldn't be blogging. And oh, by the way, if you work for a really big company and you blog, they'll probably fire you. So it's probably a good idea that you focus on what your marketing team is giving you from a content standpoint. That's why speaking to marketers, it's in your best interest. If you have content that should be posted, to then provide that content to your salespeople. And that's what we do. So with my sales team, I expect my sales team to be present on social media. I expect them to post, but I don't expect them to have to come up with all the ideas themselves. That's a losing battle. So my marketing team on a, on a you know, regular, almost every other day basis, sends out a list of articles or content 
that we think are interesting. And we allow the salespeople to choose the content based on their personality, their mood, what they're focusing on from that content list. And it's a much better way to use content as a way to pull people in so that then you can prospect out to them than otherwise. So that's, that's just my take on that. And I'm, 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 I'm just, I've become a militant about this because it's, it's so debilitating, you know, for some people to think, oh my God, I'm not doing my job because I'm not blogging. When like, you can't even write four sentences together that w- that's readable. You shouldn't blog. That's not, that's not your talent base. You should go close business. That's what your talent base is. And I really like how, um, like for some people, blogging is their thing for other people, blogging is not their thing. And as Jeb pointed out, focusing on your talent base, I feel like just doing that can really help you with, um, like being able to shatter through any of the sales slumps you have and not feeling like you're being held back or anything like that. One of the things I do want to ask you about is you mentioned you come out with like just 40 to uh, 50 second videos. And I'm wondering how do you do that, uh, provide value and also like tell people like where they can find you on the web or and other things like that. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily do it. I mean, I, it, you know, if I, if I produce a 30 second video, it's usually, you know, it's a soundbite or, you know, like I did one, uh, I did one, I posted one on LinkedIn that's up right now. And it, it, it was at like 14, 15,000 views this morning. Um, and it was just, it was it's the title of the videos. Don't, don't, don't bro me till you know me. And it was a simple video. I shot it in my hotel room. I was at the Fairmont in San Francisco and I had uh, gotten a couple of emails in a, in a LinkedIn message. And then I'd gotten a phone call from a person that I didn't know that's in my space, an author. And all of them had called me bro. Like they'd started off with bro. bro. And I'm like, man, that is really bad because I, I'm, you know, part of me, I'm from the South. So I'm used to a little bit of respect. Right. But I'm like, this is bad. So I did a short video. I think the whole video was 48 seconds. Um, you know, don't bro me till you know me. I did that. Then I edited it out. And at the end of that video, I, I dropped a uh, image of my book sells EQ in it, which is relevant to the message. And, and then I put it on my LinkedIn channel. So I, and I posted them on, on YouTube and I post them in different places. So I don't, I'm not posting. I, I, I do post videos that are 15 minutes long. I post some that are two minutes long, uh, but I'm on the road all the time. I spend almost like last year, I spent 306 nights in a hotel room so most of the time I'm traveling sometimes and Mark, you, you'll probably get a kick out of this. I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm like walking down the street and I have an idea and I'll see a person stand there and I'll go, Hey, could you hold my camera for a second and just shoot, shoot a quick video for me? You know? And like, they'll look at me and I'm going, seriously, just hold it. Okay. And I'm going to talk into it. Now I may mess up. So I may get you to make, take two takes on this baby and you know, and they'll do it for me and they'll sit there and hold my video for me. So I don't look like the schmuck that's holding a video up in front of him. I got short arms. So like my whole head takes up the video. I'm standing someplace and they can see my hands and they can see, you know, my body movement and I'll shoot those videos. And when I have my video crew with me now, I'm in a different, you know, a different animal than everybody else. I have a, we have a sound studio that we built specifically for videos. It's a separate building behind our office. It's a big old studio and we're adding, we're adding onto the studio because we shoot some professional video there. I have my own video crew that travels with me a lot. And, and, and a lot of times if we've got time, we'll shoot 20 short videos that are, you know, 30 seconds to two minutes long. And we'll just create a list of subjects and we'll just rip on those subjects and we'll do it until we, we've got it tight. And we've got it worked out. Well, I mean, think about it. How many people can afford to have a video crew follow you around all the time? Most people can't do that. So I, I'm, I use everything that I can. Sometimes I've got my email address and my, you know, my website address on there. Most of the time, at least I have my logo on the, um, on the video. And sometimes I don't. The, the, if, I were a, um, if I were a salesperson and I was shooting short videos like that, there's so many cool little editing tools out there that you can get these days. That all you do is you create those graphics in advance and you just pop them onto or blend them into your video so you have that there. Uh, sometimes if you've got enough time and this takes a little bit of time, you can create, you know, the, the little, uh, captions below, you know, each video. I, I did that for a while and we quit doing it because it was just so time intensive to get it done uh, and do it right. But the, but, but there's, you know, this is, it goes back to content creation. How do I know those tools? Man, I'm always looking, always on the lookout for new tools, new technology. I probably got 
you know, $10,000 worth of technology and, you know, just hardware in my studio right now that I haven't used or used once and I didn't like it. But I've got, you know, another $50,000 worth of equipment that I've used that when I tested it out, I really loved it and I kept using it. It gives us an edge. So video is fantastic. And I think that video, for I'm glad you mentioned that for salespeople, is a great way to enhance your prospecting. So, for example, if you send an email, um, you can, you know, you, you can drop a video into your email. There's a number of services that allow you to do that. Uh, but, I mean, t- these days, you, you know, if you have a Vimeo account, just pop the video on Vimeo and they can link to the, you know, link to the video. Um, you, you shoot a short video, you can put it in as an MP4 and it doesn't take up that much space. Uh, you can use services like BombBomb. Um, they're a really good, good group over there. Uh, I, they, uh, they work primarily in the real estate industry, but they've got a, a really nice platform that allows you to attach a video to an email. So then we start thinking about prospecting. You think about it like this. So you're a, um, you know, I, I'm on LinkedIn and you comment on something and I say, well, I would like to talk to this person. I shoot you over an email and say, I'd love to talk to you. Then I look you up on Zoom Info and grab your, your contact information. I, I call you. You don't answer the phone, so I leave you a voicemail. And because I have your email, because Zoom Info gave me that information as well, I plug your email in uh, to my email browser, shoot a short video on my camera, do just a tad bit of editing with that, which I do believe you should do editing. I, I think that you know, it's important that you don't just send something raw. Um, so you do that. And, and then I push send. And I send you a video of me. And I think it's really, really powerful way to prospect. And, uh, but it doesn't happen a lot, Mark, because people are afraid of the camera. I mean, they're afraid of being, you know, of, 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 of being videoed. And the only way that you're going to get unafraid and get good at being videoed is to shoot a lot of video, which most of the, your early video is going to suck and you're just going to have to get over it. And then you get better and better and better. And that's why, you know, I can go on the street you know, in a city, I did this in New York City recently, and I'm like, hey, dude, could you shoot this video for me? And people will do it for you, and I can knock it out in a couple of takes because I've done hundreds of them. So I'm, I'm better at it than when I first started doing it, where I would probably have been embarrassed to do that because I suck so bad at it. And um, like, I really like that idea of getting public uh, with the content creation, as you mentioned, creating some uh, video in New York City. I'm wondering, like, for some people, like, I find this a little bit with myself, like, I'm really good at creating content from a private standpoint. But when you get public, like deep into a city, it's a different kind of mindset, a different kind of experience. So uh, how can we uh, get better being able to create our content in the public? (laughs) <laughs> it's a that's a great question, you know, and you're exactly right. You know, the um, your uh, your you get really self aware, right, when you're sitting in a city and you're and you're shooting a video. And I do it like I do it in hotel lobbies all the time. And what you have to realize is that nobody is paying attention to you. Truly, people do not give a flying rat's ass about you. They are paid they're paying attention to everything that's happening in their life. You're the only person there that's self conscious. No one else is. So you just have to turn it all off and shoot. Now, the hardest part of it is like I, I'm a butterfly chaser. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm like, you know, high ADD. So if somebody like walks behind the person that's shooting, sometimes I'll, I'll get distracted with that or if there's a noise in the background. And you have to do a couple of shoots. But the biggest thing is, 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 and look, you're, it's not going to change the emotion you feel because when I'm shooting in public, I still feel conspicuous and self-conscious. I do. But you have to just recognize and you keep telling yourself nobody is paying attention to you. Nobody cares what you're saying. Nobody is listening to you. They are listening to themselves. And one of the things that I tell myself, this is my go-to, when I'm, especially when I'm shooting video or audio in public. Because I do you know, podcasts and I love audio, although I, I do a lot more video because I can shoot video and I can leverage that video on say YouTube and then I can pull the, the just the audio portion out of that and leverage that as an audio you know broadcast on my podcast. So I'm I'm a big fan of leveraging content in all kinds of different ways. So but but if you think about it, if you see someone in public and there are cameras pointing at that person, all of a sudden you think that person is important. Now the person that's being filmed feels conspicuous and they feel like everybody's looking at them and if they make any mistake everybody's judging them 
But everybody else is looking at the person who's being filmed and going, wow, that must be somebody. Especially if you got like a, I mean, when I have my, my camera guy with me and, you know, we're mic'd up and he's got, you know, his like, you know, I think he shoots on the Canon 300. When he's got that going, you know, people are like, who are, who are you? Who's that guy? Who's that guy? What's that person is? So it, it makes you look better. And that's what I teach experts, you know, people that are in my space that are authors. I'm like, look, man, you, you're shooting in public. People will come up to you and ask you who you are. And when they do that, you have an opportunity to meet them, get a business card, talk about a book, maybe pick up a lead. Uh, I shoot on airplanes. I, I, um, I was shooting up near the cockpit the other day ago with a, with a flight attendant because I had a great idea. And so I, I shot her and then she shot me and then I, I put it all together. And by the time I got off the airplane, I had edited the entire thing up and I uploaded it to YouTube. So it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a mindset of if you're going to be a content creator. So, you know, I go back to what I said before. Not everybody is a content creator, nor should everybody be a content creator. But if you're compelled to do that and you're driven to do that and it's something that you really enjoy doing, because I think that's part of it, you have to enjoy shooting and making content, you know, then, then everywhere is your canvas. Every place you go is an opportunity to, to shoot something. And I'm leaving for Europe. I'll be gone in Europe for three weeks. And, and, and I've got, I'm taking, you know, cameras, I'm taking mics, I'm taking the equipment that I need that I can travel with. Because we're going to shoot every cool place that we can find, we're going to shoot a sales video. And I and I, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see all of these places that I've been because it's fun. You know, the, the backdrop changes. It's a little bit different. You create the aura that you're al- always moving, and I am always moving. So it's, uh, I mean, it's just, a, it's just a blast to do it. And you, you, you never know what video that you shoot is going to be, you know, something that's going to, you know, that's going to go viral for you or be a hit for people. You just never know what that's going to be. And uh, again, I really like that idea of going public with the content creation because there's just so many more opportunities. Like for someone to say, like, okay, I'm going to Europe. Well, your, your studio is in another country. And uh, I mean, like Jeff has a team of people following him, but for most people, that's just not happening. So it's like, okay, I got to wait until I get back to create the content, but you create the content in all these awesome places. So I'm really happy that you, you shared that with us because that I think that's a game changer for content creators, being able to create content in public. And one of the things that I also want to tap on is uh, one of the things that I also see as a game changer is reading as many books as possible. I know you've written a bunch, including your book, Fanatical Prospecting, which we've been talking about for quite a while. But I wonder if you could share with us three books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Yeah, I, the one book I, I, I love um, is called The uh, Lost Art of Closing, and it's by my friend uh, Anthony Anarino. Fantastic book. Uh, I, I, I recommend it because of the way that it walks you through the process that people make decisions. The second book that I love, it's a, it's a good, com, a wonderful companion to fanatical prospecting is High Profit Prospecting by my good friend Mark Hunter. And it's a book that it's got some different perspectives on prospecting that you won't find in fanatical prospecting. And when people read those two books together, they, they, they get, they get a much broader view of, all of the different techniques that you can use to move someone into your pipeline. And then from a messaging standpoint, and this goes back to content creation. So you know, part of content creation is getting the right message, getting the right cadence down. Uh, my friend, Mike Weinberg, uh, wrote a book called New Cell Simplified, and it's been a mega bestseller. It's a fantastic book. It's one of my favorite go-to books. I've, I've read it at least a dozen times because of the way Mark, uh, or excuse me, the way Mike, walks you through and takes you through the process of developing and building out your core messages. And if you're, if you're going to be a content creator or you're, you know, you're going to, you're going to be prospecting in and you're trying to figure out what to say and how to say it. I think Mike's book is, uh, is, is the Bible for, uh, you know, for those type of messages and also for building the right mindset. And I would, I would highly recommend those books. Law started closing Anthony and Reno, uh, high profit prospecting Mark Hunter and you self simplified by Mike Weinberg. 
Jeb, thank you for sharing off those th- uh, great book recommendations. Those will all be in the show notes, marketbirdie.com slash E245. Anthony was actually a guest on the Breakthrough Success podcast a while back. So we'll actually include the link to that episode in the show notes as well. And we'll also throw in content marketing secrets, which uh, you can get for free at marketbirdie.com slash book. Just pay for the shipping. But before we wrap up this episode... Jeb, um, I've asked you several questions throughout our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? I think the question that you have to ask yourself, and and this goes back to what you said about people getting more comfortable creating in in public. And and just for the record, by the way, I'm not taking a video crew with me to Europe. I'm just taking me. My my (laughs) video guys, they're not that lucky, right? I'm taking an (laughs) iPhone. And a microphone, you know, a, a, a lav mic that I picked up off of uh, Am- or, yeah, Amazon, I'm just taking that. And the person that's traveling with me is going to hold, this is going to be my tripod. That's it. You know, so it's as simple as that. And, and the, the question that, that I have that you should be asking yourself is how bad do you want it? So if you're, if you're a content creator and you, you want to get your content out there, how bad do you want to do that? Because if you want it bad enough, You'll get over yourself and you'll, you'll go out in public and you'll do those things. You won't be a perfectionist. If you're a salesperson and you, and you want to get in, you know, fill up your pipeline, then you'll do the hard work that you have to do in, in, you know, in prospecting to do that. So if you ask that question of yourself every time you wake up, you know, each time you wake up in the morning or every time you doubt yourself or every time you're in a situation and you think, wow, this is going to be hard, if you just ask that one question, how bad do I want this? If you can answer that question, um, then you'll know whether or not it's something you should do or something that you should ditch in your life and go get something else to focus on. Jeb, thank you for sharing with us that great question. All the great insights through our time together. If you guys want to learn more about Jeb, get his book, Fanatical Prospecting. He also has a lot of other books um, available on Amazon, a bunch of other places. You can learn more about that and him as well at his site, jebblunt.com, uh, J E B. B-L-O-U-N-T dot com. But Jeb, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on Breakthrough Success and sharing all of your great insights with us. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate you having me on. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn 